the Planet IMEX session for October. The objective of today is to give a regional update on the impact of COVID-19 on the business events industry, and we specifically are going to get feedback with regards to the African continent. My name is Esmeri Steinoffel. I'm the Regional Director at ICA for Africa, the International Congress and Convention Association, and I will be moderating the session today. As a start, I'm going to introduce our panelists. We've got Santo Meyise from the Durban KwaZulu-Natal Convention Bureau. Welcome, Santo. Then we've got Kumbi Chiweshi from the Victoria Falls DMC based in Zimbabwe. Glenn Taylor from the Century City Conference Center in Cape Town, South Africa. And then also from South Africa, Nina Frazen Pretorius, the CEO of the conference company, and Frank Murangwa from the Rwanda Convention Bureau. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Esmer. Start off with the questions and to get, get feedback. I think it's nice that we've got um, various sectors represented. Um, convention bureaus, DMCs, professional conference organizers, and, um, and venues. So as a start, Nina, what is your biggest challenge at the moment? With regard um, thank you. to yeah, securing new business, um, working with associations, Thank you, Esme. Thank you for the opportunity to participate with the esteemed panelists um, and colleagues today. I think that um, our sector has always been seen as a very positive sector. We bring people together. It's a little bit exciting. The beautiful venues, beautiful destinations. Um, and then the opportunity to obviously um, have some legacy projects, you know, when you've got a conference of whatever nature, particularly in associations. But I think with your question, what is the biggest challenge at the moment, I think to be um, extremely truthful and upfront and honest is staying in business. I think operationally very, very challenging from a South African perspective. Um, I'm sure my um, friends from South Africa and colleagues will agree that since our lockdown in March, which we agree was very necessary, um, we haven't had revenue. I know many other venues and suppliers that we're um, working with, um, they've had to cut staff. Some of them are under business rescue. And so I think whilst there is um, an appetite for later on in the year, and we have seen that associations are much more resilient with not necessarily cancelling meetings in 2020, but postponements, the reality is between now and the, when the postponement happens, and we probably looking at earliest quarter two, quarter three, definitely quarter four. We're hoping that, that it would return, return to more face-to-face -face meetings. I think is keeping the wheel, wheels turning, keeping our staff operational, making sure that our other suppliers are there because we don't, um, as a sector, operate individually. We're really very reliant on the um, industry ecosystem. And so very, very challenging cash flow. There is an appetite. But also, I think that maybe whilst we've got a, a cash flow and, and challenging financial scenario, also associations that are not for profit, they are in the same boat. So we are finding that um, clients are very risk averse. Um, they are very price sensitive. And potentially um, a virtual option or a hybrid option that at the moment for the foreseeable year ahead, I'm thinking that virtual is the only option. It's affordable, um, it's safer, um, and that we'll return to conferencing as we knew it uh, in quarter two, three of next year. Lynn, from your perspective as a venue, is it similar to what Nina's mentioned or are there anything you would like to add? Yeah, I think we, we sit in a very similar boat um, being a venue. Our biggest challenge at the moment is is really converting advanced deposits that we've taken into liquidity. Um, you know, when, when the lockdown happened in March, the industry was very sympathetic towards one another and they were saying, don't worry, just keep the deposits and we'll look at another date when, and we'll recontract and everyone sat back to wait and see what happened. Um, we then evolved and time grew and grew and grew and the uncertainty around it and I think death by social media, so instilled fear and global fear. And this thing just gained momentum. And from that, the sympathetic attitude, people are saying, now we wanted their, their deposits back. 
um, people were saying, well, we're not happy to postpone. So for us, we had to evolve. Um, we created the Century City Virtual Conference Center in an attempt to try and convert some of that into the, the new world, if you would like to call it. Um, and hopefully that would entice some hybrid conferences when the, the lockdown level two came into to play. Um, but that's been a challenge. Obviously, we, we've also got a lot of people that we employ. And um, whilst there was some kind of benefit through tours in this country from the UIF and, and staff, we took the decision to, to pay our staff initially over the three months um, and then claim that back. And of course, that's, that was difficult because there was challenges whilst they were trying to get those platforms into play. I'm talking government now. And so as the private sector, we, we really did battle. We were alone. Um, we also then were turned down from our business insurance guys saying that uh, business interruption was no longer there. So that's now in court. Um, and whilst this is all happening and we're confident that these things are going to come to fruition, we've got to maintain the cash flow and the liquidity in the business to float this during the season. And, and people don't understand that. So it's, it's quite harsh that we've, we've, we're the ones that are feeling the pain. Um, and then, of course, we've also had to, to cut down our staff numbers to make sure that our business continuity plan came into play and we had a business so that people could come back and make sure that there was a business for people to come back to. So we're looking at reduced staff numbers and you've now gone from departmental management to umbrella management and you've got chefs making beds, you've got receptionists serving coffee. And you've had to diversify. It's been a great upskill session for those that have been left behind. Um, but it's challenging. I think the hardest thing that we faced with every week is our rosters because that changes daily given the current lockdown period and, and business that we see. Um, but it's got to, you know, we, we're also trying to create the message of hope and encouragement because we can't preach it and not act on it. So we've taken a decision to remain open and show that we're resilient and that we can cope with the pandemic and, and encourage the corporates and the sector to get, to get back. So the other key challenge is how do you stay relevant and aware? Because once this all releases, everyone's going to be knocking on the door trying to get their business relevant. And so it's a lot of balls juggling at the moment from our side. I think we also often hear it is about adapting to the new normal and to be flexible. And as you say, the chef is now helping um, with, with housekeeping. Tonto, as a convention bureau that deal with a different market segments, you deal with corporate um, conferences, government events, association events, the incentive market, um, securing business and hosting conferences. Also now that South Africa um, is open again. Um, is the challenge the same for all the market segments to get them to start to conference or do you see that some are going to likely start um, earlier with actually having the face-to-face -face events? Well, thank you, Esmarie, for arranging this. In honesty, it's been a difficult six months for all of us, including us working for government as convention bureaus. As you've said, um, the fellow panelists, what they've actually mentioned about the difficulty in staying in business and all that. Remember, we rely on them in terms of us bringing business as well into Deben and Guazulu Natal. So it's been a tricky situation as well um, when everything else is shut down because there's nothing that is actually happening. So for me, in honesty right now, the most difficult thing is to actually say all the events that are going to come into the destination, how are we going to negotiate with the partners that uh, we're going to bring these events to the destinations. We are in constant contact with the associations, the event owners to say, at Durban and KZN, we're still open for business. They must actually bring back their events. You might know that most of the association meetings are rotational. So there's a tricky element in there to say, you were supposed to host in 2020, so you didn't host in 2020, then what happened? So getting back into business is really going to take a lot of negotiations with the associations and making sure that our partners like your PCOs, your venues, 
all other value chain is actually working together in making sure that we revive the industry together so that we are able to bring business back to the destination. But the challenges are almost the same because everyone has had the difficult time with the pandemic. Frank, over to you. We've heard about the challenges from um, sort of companies based in South Africa. Rwanda opened their borders based in East Africa a little bit um, prior to South Africa. Are your challenges still similar or do you see more of a pickup in, in business coming to the destination? Uh, thank you, as Mariandi, uh, to my fellow panels. Uh, good morning once again. Uh, really, the, the challenges, the, uh, challenges are still out there. Uh, the first challenge I think we continue to see is the uncertainty is really going to, uh, to end when we're going to have vaccine, when we're going to create confidence for people to travel again. Uh, indeed, as you said, we uh, opened the industry mid-June uh, this year. Uh, we started with local events and the uh, also local domestic tourism. Uh, but of course, since then, we've uh, seen less number coming to the country. And the, really, that is the confidence we're still lacking because of one uncertainty. Today, we see uh, more improvements in the region, but we get to see, again, uh, cases increasing from the source market. So really, that affects our planning and it affects everything we do as a destination. Uh, but more important, as we continue to open, we've seen, of course, some of the events is starting to, uh, you know, to come to, to the country. And the uh, uh, really beginning of this month, we hosted the, one of uh, the biggest event we're supposed to host it this year. Uh, AJRF, we hosted it uh, under hybrid uh, format. But uh, if you look at the numbers that it came to the destination, they are really very uh, minimal compared to the normal event we were supposed to host. Uh, what does that mean? It, it translates into really loss of revenues that would come into the destination. And the, you all know that our industry is one of the drivers for the economic development of the country uh, through employment, through, you know, export. And the, if we don't have confidence of no uh, bringing events back to our countries, then our absolute as a destinations will keep on losing. So absolutely, yeah. There's still a lot of challenges out there. However, we are optimistic that perhaps in the near future, this should be overcome. Thank you, Frank. Um, Kumbi, from your side, um, we've spoken about the challenges now. What has COVID-19 taught you about um, your business, our industry, your regional ecosystems? Any learnings from, um, from the pandem um, pandemic? Uh, thank you very much for the session today. Um, I think it's been, my learnings have been largely positive, um, largely two things, two observations. One, uh, the importance of collaboration, uh, even in competition. And the other thing is also, um, under, you know, the, the lack of, of understanding, perhaps from policymaker perspective of, of, our, of our industry. So I'll speak about uh, collaborative uh, uh, competition first. Um, it's played out in a practical way in our region. Uh, we've got the Victoria Falls Regional Tourism Association, which was recently formed actually pre-COVID. Um, but it's been very encouraging to see that even during COVID, it's actually grown stronger and there's been stronger interest uh, even in different players coming together to, to work together to promote the region, to grow the pie, as it were. And the Victoria Falls Regional Tourism Association is made up of uh, four different countries, which is Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, Botswana, um, and Namibia. And that's really working hard to promote our, our region and give more exposure both to leisure and business events as well. Um, so that's been very, very encouraging to see and um, looking at everybody working together to grow the pie, uh, as it were, and to give more exposure, more options as well to, to our clients coming in uh, into our region. Um, looking at the Ica family, I've seen similar sort of strides, which has been very encouraging, especially with our first uh, regional collaborative conference to share leads uh, and to share, you know, key learning points as well. So destinations normally would be competing against each other. So it's really good to see 
um, the spirit of collaboration uh, and working together to make our whole region and Africa a, a better uh, destination for, for business events. Then the other thing was uh, when the lockdown started, um, uh, you know, the sector being lumped together with, 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 with mass gatherings, uh, when in actual fact, uh, I like the way it was put in one of the webinars that it's, you know, our conferences incentives are controlled planned events and always have had strict protocols and processes anyway. Um, so this, this, this also highlighted the need for us to do a bit more uh, to educate perhaps policymakers on what exactly we do and the kind of controls that are in place uh, anyway. Um, so, so the key challenge coming out of that was that when even as the rest of uh, tourism has been opening, I think the exception has been in Rwanda because, you know, there's a very deep understanding of what the business events uh, industry is all about. It's, it's been very hard because we have to lobby a bit more uh, to be able to get, um, you know, that our sector opened and we still are in our part of the world, still are lobbying. So by and large, there have been a lot of important lessons that have come out of it. Um, and these are the sort of uh, positives that I've taken out of it from this part of the world. Kumbi, I really like that comment. And I think there's also a learning for, for all of us to, as a continent, work closer together to bring more events to, um, to Africa. And also in a lot of the webinars that, that I've been listening to, a lot of talk and people do say that after local events, regional events are first going to travel a bit more and to host their conferences and their incentives. And then after that, the, the international um, events will start. Maybe for, for Santo and for Frank, um, any ideas on how regionally, um, as convention bureaus promoting um, the, the countries on the, on the continent. Any ideas on how we can work closer together? Um, Esmeri, I think we, we've been talking about this through our ECA African chapter as well. And um, I've seen it as well because I've been attending most of the Planet IMAX uh, community engagements as well in terms of making sure that we collaborate Competition, yes, it is healthy, but the collaboration is the key right now. So we need to make sure that if Frank has hosted some events in Rwanda, for example, there's no harm in him sharing with us in terms of those events so that we can actually host those events because they rotate. So learning from each other is critical and also collaboration is very important right now. So COVID-19 for me has actually taught us that we need to be innovative and we need to think outside of the box and actually stop saying uh, if Frank has hosted 20 events, I actually need to make sure that I'm in competition with him. Let me learn from him. How did he attract those events to come to Rwanda so that I can be able to make sure that I speak the same language to the same associations or event owners so that they can bring business to the destination as well. But the most critical element in all this, as Marie, I would like to say, we need governments to realize the importance of hosting these business events because it has shown that over the COVID-19, without these business events, the economy actually had a dive. So they need to make sure that they support more of these uh, business events so that we actually grow our economy even better out of COVID-19. Also, Santo, to your point, I think there's a lot of um, sharing of information because on the continent, different countries are starting to open at different times and we all have our various policies in place. So, yeah, I think to, to share more amongst the, the African countries with regards to what protocols you've put in place, what's working, what's, um, what's not working. Frank, before we go over to the, to the next topic, anything to add to what Santo said with regards to this yeah. working closer together? 
Yeah, sure. No, Esmer, I do really agree with what Santo has shared because we, we've we realized at love that uh, collaboration is going to be the, uh, the best uh, and the important factor in us moving forward together. And the, uh, this is really based on association, but also when you look at the even other uh, other types of uh, events we all want to host. There are some of the events that are attached to governments and the uh, part of the bigger uh, communities. And when you uh, focus on those ones and you share information, it then becomes easier for even other destinations you know, to tap into those uh, events and attract them to their uh, destinations. But more important, I think something that we've learned from uh, this COVID period is also uh, understanding the ecosystem you have around you, especially focusing on uh, your local associations, building them, working with them, because they have uh, information on what is happening in their uh, ecosystem. And it, this is really something that I would like to encourage you because we've seen it working for us, getting to work with the local organization, the, working with the local cooperative organizations you have in your market, working with associations, they take you to the regional bodies. Uh, again, we realize that, that the regional market should be a key focus for all of us. Uh, as you know, uh, the continent has opened, but there's still a lot of, you know, fear to fly from for more than six hours. So I think the best way right now is really to focus on what you have next to you. And it's uh, something that may really work closely for us, for Africa. Thank you, Frank. Um, I think adapting has been also a, a buzzword at the moment. We all had to adapt to um, the new normal. If we can speak a little bit about how are you reworking your offerings um, to meet the current needs. Lynn, you mentioned the um, Century City Virtual Conference Center. How did that all go about? Um, how do you do things differently? Um, there's been a lot of the stuff in the, in the media um, about that to meet the needs of your clients. Yes, is, I think <clears throat> that's, you know, the virtual world is, is certainly it's everyone's saying it's the new norm. Uh, I, I tend to disagree somewhat. I think people are zoomed out and um, there's only so much where people talk over one another and get interrupted and and it's a beautiful legacy that face-to-face -face engagement is never going to die. It keeps uh, economy, economies and sub-economies alive. It keeps continents relevant. And so whilst we've had to evolve to this world, it's really us putting our name out there and saying, guys, we're here. You know, there's certain educational sectors that will evolve and morph into the new hybrid that can do their, their webinars, et cetera, on an educational basis. But really, you've got that engagement for an hour, two hours, and it's, 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 it serves a purpose for the time. It's certainly not going to be our full focus. You know, as the pandemic broke, my business partner and I mid mid-build of a brand new hotel right next door to me. In fact, I had to close the window because the cranes are going. And so we're still, we still very confident that this is going to come back and it's going to come back. But whilst we all say collaboration, our biggest reworking is, is a buzzword in our business at the moment is agility. And we've had to remain flexible and agile to make sure that we can weather the storm. Now, an example of this is and I think all of us are faced with these challenges, whether it be a bureau, whether it be a venue host, whether it be a, a PCO or event organizer, is that everyone is risk adverse. And so you've got a massive transfer from, of risk. People just don't want it. They don't want to pay deposits. And if they do pay a deposit, they want it in a trust account. They possibly want the PCO to be the contracting party, but they don't have a balance sheet to be the contracting party. And so we've had to really get involved and that, that I must tell you is in the, exists in the corporate world as in the association world from a contracting perspective. And so people just can't carry this burden and we've stepped in with a lot of our contracts to work with the relevant corporates, associations, with the PCO to say, guys, make sure that, uh, the, that we transfer risk and, and we, we make sure that the parties are happy and if it has to go into a trust, it goes into a trust. But, you know, you, you certainly, I don't know many um, PCOs that can, that, that can contract a, a multi-million rand event. Um, and it, it just, it's not fair to put that pressure on them. So 
we found that we're working very closely with the people that support our business, the various associations, et cetera, to engage and be agile and flexible to make sure that we still are contracting events 2022, 2023, because that's, that's the sustainability that we need. Whilst we all say we're going to rely on the local market at now, there is only so much local market and it's in a cash-strained environment to rely on. So I think that's a big focus and drive of ours. Yes, the hybrid world is there, and, and, but there's certain pharmaceutical companies, for instance, that need those networking engagements to sell their products to the doctors, and that can't be done in this hybrid world. So, so that's our drive at the moment, is we reworking every single event case by case as we go. You know, as a professional conference organizer, um, do you find similar to, um, to at the Century City Conference Center with regards to contracting of events, clients wanting you to take more of a, of a risk, financial risk? Um, yeah, the short answer is most definitely yes. I um, completely concur with Glenn. And I think um, quite some time ago in the ICA annual report and statistics, um, when ICA has a sort of a review and looks at the feedback and the number of meetings, um, I think in 2019, we had like our record number of meetings, uh, obviously a minimum of 50 delegates, so not always very big meetings. But I think we'd already seen that um, the trend was that there were going to be lower numbers, shorter stays, smaller meetings, but potentially more meetings. So in a COVID environment, we can actually potentially still, those can still happen because we can be compliant and um, ensure that our delegates and our clients um, are safe. And I think um, just listening to what Kumbi saying, Franklin and Santo, I think um, based on the, the situation that we find ourselves, technology has definitely advanced. And I think that's been good for us because I think the world is changing. I completely agree that face-to-face -face and hugging and having a glass of wine and a chat or showing a product um, and having that engagement is never, ever going to go away. But I also think that realistically um, we're in this um, challenging situation and people are predicting for quite some time. I think the airlines are saying that for next year, they're looking at a 70% reduction in revenue. And that's a tremendous amount of, of money and dollars and, and that we're speaking about. And so the risk aversity that Glenn um, touches on and the agility is really, really um, top of mind. And I think one of our challenges is that um, you know, as Africa, we were always seen as an emerging destination and Frank's got the gorillas and Kumbi's got the Victoria Falls and Santa and I have the beach and Glen and you, um, Esme, with the mountain and it's fabulous and everyone wants to come. But I think now associations being so risk averse, we are actually competing with other uh, destinations. So who's going to put the money on the table? Who's going to take um, that risk? And then what is the cost effectiveness of the destination? And there, I definitely think we as a continent are going to have to collaborate because we're really not that cheap a destination. Very often our international customers will think that we're going to be that much cheaper. And we're not really, we're really competitive to other European or American destinations, but we're not a cheap destination. And so I think there's going to be this battle to, um, you know, deal with the uh, risk aversity of the clients, come up with a cost effective product. We're not going to be able to compete um, with putting funding on the table. And I don't think we should. We're developing, we've got to build schools and educate our people and clinics and um, clean water. I think that's much more important. And um, I do think that online is not going to go away. Um, I think that what it will mean is that we'll have smaller meetings. We'll be able to potentially have the other delegates that the university or the organization can't afford to come. They can present a post or a paper online. And hopefully with our convention bureaus and tourism authorities marketing that those people that presented a post to the next time they say, gee whiz, I have to go to South Africa, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, Zambia, where, Botswana, wherever it is, on the continent because my colleague went. So I, I, I definitely think smaller meetings, we're going to have to adapt. Virtual is here to stay. Uh, and then we just need to protect ourselves a little bit as well. 
Um, and like Glenn was saying, looking at those contracts, because sometimes the business isn't worth the risk to us as the destination, as PCOs and as venues at the end of the day. Um, and we mustn't just jump in where angels fear to trade. Maybe I know you were working on an African association where you were um, the conference organizing uh, organizer for that was going to happen in 2020. And um, they've now postponed to 2021. Was it a case of you basically just copied and pasted the whole thing as it was from 2020 to 2021? Or did, <clears throat> sorry, or did the association ask you to maybe add a virtual component? Or did they request additional services from you as the, as the organizer? Or is it at this stage just a little bit too early and they just want you to hold the space um, for the face-to-face -face, um, component? Uh, thank you, uh, Esme. I think it was a combination of, of, of all of the ones that you mentioned. Um, they definitely, they actually wanted to have the event um, from August to December, but it became clear that, you know, countries reopening was going to be a bit slower than everybody had hoped for. And um, after speaking to them, we then uh, rescheduled for same time uh, next year. And ironically, the dates were almost exactly the same. Um, but they were already going to have a bit of a virtual component as well, because they'd asked for this year's conference to be set up with the capabilities uh, for others, other delegates to tune in. So it, 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 it hasn't changed that much. Uh, from, from the feedback that we get from them, um, everybody's desperate to come. <laughs> so, so in that sense, um, because there's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of, you know, networking, and Nina spoke about hugging and sharing the wine and looking at things, that, that, that's, that's, that's never going to go away for sure. And, and people still want to, to experience everything there is um, to experience at a destination. So I think we've been quite fortunate in that regard. And Victoria Falls is a fantastic destination as well. Um, and there's quite a number of people who've never been there uh, who are desperate to come. So I think that that's been our experience. We've got another uh, longer hall conference, which was rescheduled as well uh, to next year. So it's currently the same. I think the challenge is really on the government side, um, more from a, um, you know, lifting the quarantine requirements, but that's really going to be a country specific event. We realize that or process rather um, and keeping safety uh, in mind. So I think as, as, as countries start to open up and allow travel and, and the process is a better harmonized globally, that, that may, may slowly start to return along with the confidence as well for people to get onto planes for long. Thanks Kumbi. Um, my next question is going to be to the two convention bureaus. Um, in Africa, we've always focused on the legacy of, um, of business events. Your thoughts on the long-term economic opportunity for the continent? I mean, COVID-19 will eventually pass and we will get back to our, as Nina said, hugs and glasses of wine. Um, legacy and the opportunity for the continent? Frank? Yeah, thank you, Esmeri. I think really the, the legacy, the business events uh, brings it to our destinations is uh, obvious. If you look at uh, the economic opportunities that our sector brings, one is the, the export, uh, which has been really the major uh, objective for most of the destinations. Why are we doing this? Is because this sector really contributes to uh, bringing in foreign exchange to the country, and it, that is uh, a critical part of any country that is developing. And, and so, really, these are the future opportunities I uh, foresee for the sector to bring back to the economy. Uh, but second point, I think that is quite critical is also job creation. As you all know, for the last six months, our jobs were put. Uh, really on a standstill for most of the people in the private sector, you know, reduced their, uh, uh, their staff. Uh, and so for, for, for us, the comeback of the sector is to really, again, create jobs, uh, encourage more investments in the sector, uh, attract more uh, job creation. And that's really the legacy we're talking about in the revamping 
the entire uh, ecosystem. Uh, the third point, I think, which we all know is the really contributing to the uh, the value chain of our industry, of our society, whether it's really multiplier effect on agriculture, on transport, on banking, and everything. And the, this is what uh, we, our government, the government of Rwanda, chose to really uh, develop the sector. We've seen the benefits. We know the importance of the sector. And that's why we even right now we've taken the lead to reopen the sector. Uh, start small, but of course, whatever small comes in is giving back to the community. Really, those are the most key uh, uh, really factors I would put uh, the share, uh, but uh, which I believe is quite similar to most of the destination that are at the level of uh, developing. Thanks, Frank. Santo from the Durban Kuzulu Natal Convention Bureau side. Uh, thank you, S. Marie. You know, you are talking about face to face hugging. I can't wait for us to go back to normal and actually host meetings in normality where we meet face to face. But anyway, in terms of the legacy, I think it's high time that as governments, PCOs, associations, event owners, we need to now start striking a balance between calculating the rents and cents in terms of making sure that we have return on investment and also leaving a lasting legacy for our destinations. Because that's the critical component that we normally lose when we actually say, um, what legacy is the event going to leave for the destination? As South Africa and Durban and Guazulu Natal as a whole, we've taken a stance to say, when we host the events, remember, we are able to create new research uh, in terms of making sure that there's new research that we leave with uh, people who are academics, people who are in different fields. And number two, we are able to make sure that we transfer the skills to the local communities, which is something that will live with them for longer when we're actually hosting these events. So, in terms of making sure that hosting these events have a lasting legacy, make sure that you have a, a project that will be able to also involve communities so that you can actually transfer skills and they are able to continue doing these things on their own. But over and above that, I think we need to make sure that in terms of hosting these events, what recommendations that come out of hosting the conferences may be that can also influence the government policies because that becomes critical at the end of the day. We can't just host the events and say, oh, okay, what is the return on investment? If it doesn't give me money, how are you going to calculate the skill that the conference bring into the destination? How are you going to uh, calculate the empowerment that you're going to leave for communities? And even other lasting legacies, I can even talk about the conference on AIDS that happened in Durban in 2016. 16, we still see the results even today. So we need conferences that are going to be structured in a way that we're not only calculating rents and cents. I think COVID also has taught us that, that it's not about rents and cents, but it's what you leave for the communities and what government can actually use um, that information to influence the policies. And that can be done by us. It can be us who actually assist government in terms of making sure that when they structure the programs, they are aligned with the government priorities. Frank, you mentioned um, job creation and Santo, you mentioned skills. Now that made me think of, and I'm going to direct this question to Lynn and to Nina. That made me think of staff training. Um, I think a lot of us knew the basics of having a Skype call or a Zoom call, but it is you need a different skill set um, if you want to organize a professional webinar with registration. And especially when, you know, as a conference organizer, you're starting to charge delegates um, to attend a virtual event. How big a focus, and I'm going to start with you, Glenn, with your chef that's now um, working housekeeping. Has training a new skill set been a focus for the venue? Uh, completely. Uh, thanks. Yes. I've actually got maintenance pants on underneath this suit and I'm going to go and fix the back wall after this 
the same call. Um, now, yeah. I, th I think that um, it, it certainly has. Uh, so, for instance, a good example of our meeting and events coordinator and team is, is essentially to facilitate the, the needs from the professional conference organizer and whatever association or delegate is looking for. Their role has changed to be the actual operations team now. So no longer are they the one giving the ops team the function sheet. They are the ops team. They are the person that runs the event on our platform. So in conjunction with our, our, our virtual conference facility, we have our own platform that we've created and people can essentially come by space on that platform. And so that event organizer is no longer the person to make sure that the team coffee is out, they're there to make sure that we bring on airs and not Frank at the wrong time and to make sure that it runs seamlessly and the event goes without hitch. And at the same time, during that break, there is an exhibitor that is, is putting their, their spread on and that they're getting the, the mileage that they need, et cetera. So, so that's just one example. But, but honestly, I walked through, we, we have enjoyed subsequent to level two and level now one, we have had quite a few hybrid events from the corporate sector because the corporates just aren't returning to their offices as, as of yet. And where it's a sales driven environment, those corporates are, are needing to communicate to their teams across South Africa. And we're talking the local, local market now, the local corporates. And so we have had quite a few hybrid events and it was quite welcoming to see that when I walked through, because the casual components of the business has now dissipated completely from a staff perspective, to see the entire team, whether it's a debtor's clerk or a financial manager or Gary or myself, people are in the kitchen washing plates after the event. Um, and, and that's just what it is, is, is. I think there's a massive understanding and compassion from the staff um, if they've been communicated to properly. And people are just willing to muck in. At the same time, I do think it's a massive opportunity for the people that are working in the various environments to grow their skill set and to actually come out of this with a learning curve that has risen quite substantially because they've given themselves the opportunity and they've put their hands up and said, pick me, I would like to go and learn front office and do some cross training because guess what? When we come out of this, I'm going to be your new staff. And so we have seen a lot of that. Um, staff understand. As, as long as you communicate it, they understand the importance of, of staying open and mucking in to make sure that their friend that was possibly retrenched um, is, has got a spot to come back to. And, and so that is our drive at the moment. Um, certainly massive, massive cross-training. You know, as a professional conference organizer, do you, your staff also now, not just, for example, doing registration or just doing abstracts, but starting to be behind the scenes of a virtual event? Yeah, thanks, Ex Marie. Um, I um, think that um, us as humans, we actually don't realize how hugely adaptable we are um, because actually we're in a war zone. Um, you know, fortunately, we've got food and water and shelter, but I think we're really adaptable and we have to be um, in survival mode because many of us have had to put people on short time or do retrenchments. I mean, that is the reality to survive and, and also to be cost effective. So I think what it's taught us is that from a business perspective, whilst I hear about the skills training, um, but what Glenn is saying is that everybody can do more because before we had COVID, if you had to tell the chef he had to make a bed, he would go to the union and you'd have a riot and it would be a very big problem. Whereas now it's not a problem at all. And I think that's quite a positive thing in a way is that we can do it. We need to maybe rethink how we do it because if we do want to be cost effective, you need, we need to think of um, our approaches um, going forward. So from our perspective, we've all worked at home. We've all got our internet and technology, our printers, whatever, our virtual platforms. Everybody's doing everything and we're learning tremendously. And in the beginning, we were like deers in the headlights. We we're like, oh my goodness, but that's normally the IT guy that does that. And now we are the IT guy uh, and we're coming up, well, what about this software? We're learning um, all um, the time. I wanted to just um, just comment on what Santo was speaking about, about legacy and that. Um, and our challenge that um, we've had with meetings 
and conferences um, in, on the continent and getting our business leaders to, to understand and actually um, value us. Because, you know, legacy is such a difficult word. And I know that the Iceberg Project has spent a lot of time and energy on trying to, you know, this is what the legacy is. And there's some, you know, there's fant some really fantastic um, 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 examples of that. But, you know, how do you quantify um, legacy when you host a conference? Maybe nothing comes out of it, but that the chairperson or the, per, the, the delegates that were involved or the South Africans or the Zimbabweans that were involved that were the representatives and the hosts, all of a sudden, internationally, they get more credibility. They thought of, um, they have more respect. They have peer support. To me, that is such a tremendous value of, and skill set that people then recognize you because maybe when they're in a board meeting, wherever it may be in Frankfurt or Geneva, and they say, well, in Africa, we are doing A, B, and C, and I collaborated with my colleague. All of a sudden, well, we've been there. We've seen your stand your challenges. And to me, that's like, a how, how, do I, how do I package that, that legacy and that importance? Because we've got such awesome, fantastic people with all the problems and the politics and stuff that we have. We are just such a warm, awesome continent and I think the best continent in the world. And how do we package that? How do we adapt? How do we, we're not going to ever be cost effective. I think we are, we are the people and we are the magic and how we adapt to this is uh, and our skill set and, and all of that. I think that's going to really be our legacy and that is part of our skills and, and, and our ability to adapt. You know, to your point, um, I think also if we look at the African continent, we still have uh, not a big number of countries with convention bureaus. So again, going forward, it get governments to understand the importance of focusing on business events. Um, and then the legacy will follow, the economic impact will, um, will follow. So I think in those of us um, that have the bureaus and we've seen the impact, it's to also um, spread the word to the, to the rest of the continent via the various um, that that we have. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time, so I'm going to go over to the to the closing um, questions. Kumbi, I'm going to start with you. Looking ahead, the crystal ball. Um, your outlook for the remainder of 2020 and what you think is likely going to happen in 2021, um, specifically looking at how things are starting to open in Zimbabwe. And again, I know the, the incentive market is a big focus um, for the destination, besides the association and the, and the conference market. What is your crystal ball saying about the destination? It's not saying much. I'm going to have to guess a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I think a lot of it is to do with the domestic uh, tourism uh, more than anything else. That's just starting to open up here in Zim. Uh, and our region, and regional tourism as well. Uh, reaching out, South Africa has always been a very important market for us, so is East Africa a growing the important market. Uh, so I think for, for, for leisure as well as for business events, this is probably where we're going to see uh, some sort of near-term impact. The rest of it is really making sure our overseas clients and partners understand what's happening on the ground here. Um, I think that the benefit of the regional, uh, our regional colleagues and, and clients is that they have a good understanding of what's happening in our part of the world as well. So I really think a lot of that's going to come out of there more than anything else. And the other thing, um, I think also just the general energy and excitement that I see from colleagues and partners in the region as well, just with, with everything starting um, and sharing of information. I see a lot of groups that have been formed, you know, on WhatsApp and other platforms, just talking and it's just so much excitement, um, you know, welcoming people back and just easing any concerns that they, that they might actually have. So I think that's probably near term. Um, with respect to sort of beyond three months, um, it's hard to say because I think the issue of confidence has to be adequately addressed 
uh, for people to, 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 to get back onto planes and, and just and, and be able to come here. So perhaps uh, some of that will point to pharmaceutical interventions like vaccines and other things starting to come you know, on stream that'll give people the general confidence that, okay, fine, even with COVID around, at least there's a, a, some sort of backstop, if you like, some stopgap measure to, to help provide an extra layer of, of protection as well. Frank, um, looking after the distillation, um, looking at Rwanda and East Africa, your thoughts on the next months in 2020, and then also what might happen in 2021, securing business for the destination in the continent, East Africa? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, Mary, I think as we earlier shared, we all hopefully that the, we going to, the industry is going to revamp eventually. And the, I think the, this also came out through our discussions because this year, for sure, we, it was a, uh, a dead year to all, all of us. Uh, however, I think the good news is that uh, most of the clients, most of the uh, buyers, most of the planners we had were very flexible to move the events to next years. And this is really a very a good case for Rwanda. We had the very big events for this year, for 2020, but we worked with the, our partners and we pushed them to 2021 and beyond. And for me, that is the sort of data I saw from the meeting partners, understanding the uh, importance of bringing events to a destination, not just bringing an event for the sake of meeting, but also for the leaders we're talking about and for the uh, economic contribution these events will live in our destinations. And so for, for me, I remain hopeful and the, uh, to, to, to the country, but also to the continent that eventually we're going to come out of this and we're going to uh, go back to the first to the first. Uh, however, we have also to uh, really understand and uh, embrace that technology is going to be part and parcel of hosting events moving forward. Uh, uh, the good thing is that uh, we've learned through the, the hard uh, uh, process, uh, but I think at the end of the day today, we're very confident that we can be able to use webinars, we can be able to host events virtually, and that is going to be an added value to how we organize and host events in our destinations. If someone is in the in US or New Zealand, you're unable to come, then at least you can be able to follow an event happening in Rwanda or South Africa or elsewhere. So I really remain hopeful that eventually we shall come back. Santo, um, as a last comment from a destination perspective, um, South Africa, next three months, anyone? Well, for me, uh, as Marie and the colleagues will be to say, let us revive and rebuild the sector together. Um, unfortunately, right now, no one has an hour class to see what is going to happen tomorrow or in the next three months. But we can just be hopeful that we're seeing that now we're starting to get back to the normal. Um, but we need to do that in a very safe way and protect ourselves, protect our visitors, and protect even the industry that we operate in so that we are able to make sure that in the next three months, three years and beyond, we are able to go back to where we were before. But uh, for me, maybe lastly, it will be to say, as Deben and Guazulu Natal and South Africa it is a, as a destination, we are open for business and we are ready to host our visitors back into the country and to our beautiful destination. Um, after listening to, to all the comments, um, a final comment from my side, three words that um, really stood out and they all start with a, with a C is that we need to keep communicating, we need to collaborate and we need to be creative. Um, so a big thank you to um, Santo, to yourself, Kumbi, Frank, Nina, and Glenn. Really appreciated the, the insights. And also thank you um, to Planet IMX for the opportunity um, to give up a perspective and some feedback on the African continent. Have a great day further. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone.